Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad that you are here with us for worship. I do want to say a special welcome to all who are joining us by Facebook Live or on 97.9 The Bear Radio. You can find our order of service at centenarychurch.com as well as a, a link there to contribute to the ministry of our congregation. I do need to share with you that next Sunday, following the 11 o'clock worship at around 12.15 or 12.30, uh, depending on how long-winded your preacher gets, we will have a short charge conference where we will again share some of the plans around the refurbishing and capital improvements for our 250th anniversary and hope to approve uh, beginning of a new playground for our preschool. I hope that uh, you will come to, to be a part of all of that. Okay. Now, first celebrated in Waterloo, New York in 1866, Memorial Day honors those who have given, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, the last full measure of devotion. Traditionally, it is a day to remember and to honor those who died in war. This year, however, we pause to honor members of our community that served our nation and whose passing we have not been able to mark as a community of faith. I will read each name. We will have a, a chime and a time of silence. Following that, uh, we will have our, uh, our liturgy. As I read each name, family and friends are invited to stand. Charlie Buckman. Don Hill. Hal Humphrey. Carl Kendrick. Bob Maple. Ronnie Watson. and Charles Wells. Let us pray. Almighty God, before whom stand the living and the dead, we, your children, whose mortal life is but a hand's breath, give thanks to you. For all those through whom you have blessed our pilgrims, whose lives have empowered us, whose influence is a healing grace. For the dear friends and family members whose faces we see no more, but whose love is with us forever. For the teachers and companions of our childhood and you, and for the members of our household of faith, who worship you now in heaven. For those who sacrifice themselves, our brothers and sisters who have given their lives for the sake of others, that we may hold them all in continual remembrance and ever think of them as with you in that city whose gates are not shut by day, and where there is no night. That we may now be dedicated to working for a world where labor is rewarded, fear dispelled, and the nation made one.
Please join me in our greeting from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of heaven. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as ruler forever. May the Lord be strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. You are invited to stand as you are able.
and power. How awesome you are to us. The mountains tremble, the seas roar at the sound of your name. Yet you have chosen to come to us in love and tenderness. You have called us to be people who will act in ways of peace and justice in your world. Open our hearts and our spirits, Lord, to hear your word, and having heard, to act in ministries of hope and peace for all your earth. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated.
And God's people said, Amen. Thank you so much, choir. Uh, immediately following our children's sermon, our, any children that would like to go to the back for children's church will be invited to go through this door. Miss Evelyn's going to be leading us out today after, uh, after Amber shares the children's sermon this morning. So any of you children that would like to go back are welcome to. At this time, I invite you to uh, look at the screen and let's see where Amber is in the world this week. Did you know that Jesus was a carpenter? That's right, his father Joseph was a carpenter. And as a boy, I imagine Jesus spent a lot of time in the wood shop with his dad just making things. And it makes sense to me that Jesus would enjoy making things with his hands because after all, he is God. And God created the whole world, including me and you. And there's a verse in Ephesians 2.10 that says what God thinks about you and me, his creation. It says, for we were, are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. So we are God's work of art, really. And in the same way that I'm sure the craftsman who made this beautiful birdhouse is very proud of his work. Jesus is so proud of you. And he's very excited about what he has made. And he thinks that you're just wonderful. In fact, he couldn't love you any more than he does right now. And that's what I want to, I think a lot of times when people hear about doing good works, they think that they have to earn God's love and get him to be impressed with them or like them. But the truth is, he already loves you so much and you can't do anything to earn his love because he already loves you. But that doesn't mean that we don't have something very important to do. It would be kind of sad if I just left this beautiful birdhouse sitting here in the wood shop. No, I need to take it out and go hang it in a tree so that birds can come in here and stay warm when it's wet and build a nest and maybe even hatch some baby chicks. Well, in the same way, God has an amazing plan for your life and he wants to see that fulfilled. He wants you to go out and make a difference in other people's lives and provide maybe some comfort to them and do good works, not because you're trying to impress God, but because that is the wonderful thing that he has made you to do. And I hope that you're excited, and I know God is excited for all the wonderful things that he will do in you this week. Will you please join me in our prayer for illumination? Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is taken from the sixth chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. 
Our epistle lesson is taken from the eighth chapter of Romans, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished uh, that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, for very nearly the entirety of my life, uh, my family has had a dog in the house. When I was young, we had Cookie, and we had Sonny, and we had Sammy, and we had Baron. 
After Karen and I started our own family, uh, we had Vesta and we had Aslan and we had JD and now we have Ozzy and we have Elf. Each of them was special, each of them precious to our family and each of them different. Cookie was old and slow. Sunny uh, was full of energy and ready to bounce anywhere. Sammy loved to play and would bring toys to anyone, begging them to play. Baron never really learned how to play with people. Aslan was my dog. JD didn't like men, any men. <laughs> Ozzy is gentle and calm. And Elfie, though less than 20 pounds, thinks that she can take on Pastor Michael's Great Dane. <laughs> Each of them was special. But you know, the one thing that they had in common, they were all of them misbehaved. Not a one of them was disciplined and well-behaved. I never really wanted a dog that could do tricks or, 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 or was so perfectly behaved that nothing was wrong. But just once I wanted a dog that I could go for a walk and not have my arm pulled out of the socket. When Ozzy came along, we, we decided to, to try and gain just a, a little bit of discipline. So we signed him up uh, to go to the basic obedience class at the Kennel Club. We had to drop out. <laughs> Neither of us did the work that was necessary. Somehow or other, it's hard to tell Who's walking who? You know, when Nicodemus walked into that room so very long ago, he, he thought he understood how things were supposed to go. He thought he could guide the conversation in the way that he wanted. He intended to come and to speak with this young teacher and, and to bring him back into the fold, help him to understand the way things are. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, he said. A good start. Put the hearer at ease. If you have something hard to say to somebody, begin with a compliment and they'll listen. Nicodemus was ready to, to move the conversation along, to help Jesus to, to understand what really matters. And then suddenly Jesus just interrupts with what can only be called a non sequitur, literally not following. Our scripture says Jesus answered, but Nicodemus hadn't asked the question. Jesus just interjects suddenly. Truly I tell you, unless one is born anew, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Where did that come from? How could Nicodemus have seen that coming? And from that point forward, the conversation just spins out of control. Nicodemus is thrown completely off balance and has no idea what is going on. And that's the point. Because you see, that's the way it is. Time and again, through the Gospel of John, it, Jesus knocks people off balance and invites them into something totally new, totally different. You know, to, uh, to take this ever so familiar passage and just to turn it into some sort of formula of how we get into heaven misses the very point. It's less about uh, uh, the particular steps that we have to take to get to heaven than it is about the way Heaven draws us away from ourselves. Because you see, grace does have this dog walks man kind of quality. Throwing us off balance and, and bringing us to new places. The wind blows wherever it chooses, says Jesus. You hear the sound of it 
and you do not know where it comes from, and you do not know where it goes, and so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, that's the point. Grace is what happens when we're on our way to all of our other plans. Grace is an invitation to ride this mysterious spirit into a future that we could not imagine. The Christian faith is a journey, a mysterious, wonderful journey that takes us to places that we did not even understand. You know, Will Williman says that evangelism is an assault a rearrangement, a reconfiguration, literally a recreation of the world. The wind blows where it chooses. And you do not know where it comes from, and you do not know where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When we begin to understand the good news of the gospel in terms of this idea of grace blowing into our world, knocking us off balance, and leading us into new places. We are invited into the mysterious realm of God, invited to follow God. And the truth of the matter is, generally, we don't like to follow. Most of us want to tell God where to go. We want to be in charge. That's not the way it works. I want to suggest to you this morning that there is a new wind blowing, inviting us into a new future. You know, for the better part of 15 months, we have all of, this, all of us wanting a moment like this, wanting to get back to normal, as if normal is something other than a setting on your washing machine. I want to suggest to you that maybe we should understand our present time as the wind of God moving us to new places. You know, as, I, as I've thought about these past 15 months, I think there are three lessons that we can learn from this time that can guide us into God's new future. First, worship is who we are, not what we do. On March 13th, 2020, I sent an email to you and to our entire congregation announcing that for a period of time we would be suspending public worship along with all of the other congregations of the North Carolina Annual Conference. But worship didn't stop. It just changed. We didn't gather here. We worshiped where we were. Because that's who we are. Worship isn't about place. Worship isn't about pattern. Worship is about living our lives on the horizon of God's activity. You know, through these 15 months, we've actually extended the reach of worship. We've connected with people far away, folks that might not have been able to worship with us, folks that have moved, folks that can't get here. And that is something that we can continue. Second, it's our job to take care of the weakest among us. It's always been our job. We have always been the people that care for the weak, the hurting. You know, I have to, I have to tell you, N.T. Wright is a theologian for whom I have a great deal of affection. I, I frequently tell folks uh, that if N.T. Wright published his grocery list, I quite likely would buy it. And as many books as he publishes, I think he might. 
Towards the beginning of this pandemic, Wright wrote a book about God and the pandemic. And he turned to the book of Acts and to the story of the first uh, famine that came upon the, the people of faith. And he said, you know, uh, when it happened, the, the church didn't point around to folks that were, uh, that were suffering and tell them that this is the judgment of God. And, and the, uh, the church didn't wish for it to go away. Instead, the church asked three questions. Who is most likely to suffer? What can we do to help them? And who should we send? Wright suggests that those are the three questions that we should always be asking. Who is most likely to suffer? What can we do to help? And who can we send? Because you see, the one that we follow in the words of our communion liturgy is the one who fed the hungry, healed the sick, and ate with sinners. Our job is to look around to see those that are hurting and to see the ways that we can be about helping them. And third, fellowship is a gift, not a right. Time and again, through these last 15 months, I have shared with you this quotation from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer wrote, it's not simply to be taken for granted that the Christian." has the privilege of living among other Christians. Between the death of Christ and the last day, it is only by gracious anticipation of last things that Christians are privileged to live in visible fellowship with one another. My brothers and sisters, there are millions upon millions of our fellow Christians who are not able to gather together like we are. And though I may be speaking for myself, I, I suspect you too can sometimes forget that. I have to say I, I took for granted the gathering together of the people of faith. I spent too much time thinking about all of the details rather than wondering at the mystery of it all. We are the body of Christ here on earth. What a marvel! What an amazing truth. I'm not suggesting to you that God sent this pandemic to teach us to celebrate fellowship, to, to care for the weak, to expand our sense of worship. But what I am suggesting to you is that God may be inviting us into a new future, a world that is just coming into being. And it's our job to take the lessons that we can find and to ride that spirit into the tomorrow yet to be. Thomas Kenzie is an author from Massachusetts. And he tells the story of uh, going to buy a card for his father's 75th birthday. <coughs> Kinsey wanted the card to be perfect because he could not be with his dad for that important moment. And so he, he searched and he searched through all of the racks of cards and time and again, he kept coming back to this one card. And on the cover of the card was a, a scene of a, a waterfront community. And there, there on the body of water, there were two boats, a, a rowboat and a sailboat, each docked, tied to the dock. Now, while, while Kinsey lived in Massachusetts, in a waterfront community, his father lived in Ohio. They really had not spent so very much time on the water, but something about that card drew him again and again. And finally, he, he picked up the card. After he had written a, a beautiful message to his father about all of the wonders that 
uh, wonderful gifts that he had received growing up. Kinsey said to his father, you know, one of the things that I have marveled at is your simple wisdom. And I wonder, which of the boats would you choose? A week or so later, a, a letter came from his father thanking him for the card and for the wonderful words. And then the, the letter said, I noticed that the rowboat has a motor and the sailboat has a sail. Before I can answer which I would choose, I need to know, is there any wind? My brothers and sisters, there is a wind blowing. The Spirit of God is moving, calling us to a future unknown. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and you do not know where it goes. So it is with all who are born of the Spirit. Amen? Our hymn is where he leads me, I will follow.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church whose holy and apostolic faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. For those of you who are with us in worship, there are offering plates at the back of our, uh, back of our sanctuary or a QR code in the order of worship if you would like to contribute to the life of Centenary United Methodist Church. And now as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ.
As we move into a time of wow, uh, sharing joys and concerns, allow me to share a couple of things. Uh, this coming Saturday, there will be a couple of different memorial services here at the uh, church. Uh, the first one will be at 11 o'clock Saturday morning, uh, a memorial service for Bob Maple. And then at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, a service and a memorial service for Ifu Rama. And following uh, Ifu's uh, service at 2 o'clock, everyone is, uh, is invited to come over to the Habitat House uh, to share in a time of fellowship and, uh, and, uh, and some food as well. Uh, also, uh, wanted to share a joy that uh, Jim Creech is having a birthday, or just had a birthday uh, recently, so we want to share that. Uh, 97 years young. <laughs> so happy birthday. Are there any other joys or concerns to be shared this morning? Tomorrow is Karen and my 35th. 35 years. I'm going to have dear friends from the other community come visit and surprise out of the blue to, to be here. So, Doug and Nancy Dean, uh, what a blessing. It just blew my heart out. Seeing the shock on your face when they came when we were warming up this morning was priceless. Steve, so. It, it, it's always great to have friends join us in the body, and we and we are grateful. <laughs> are there others? Let's go to the Lord for a time of prayer. Heavenly Lord, we are so grateful to be here today for the singing, for the praise, for the celebrations. We are just thankful to be amongst our friends in this time of joy and fellowship. Lord, not everyone is, is enjoying this time of worship because so many do struggle, Lord. And you know how difficult it is in this wayward, lost world that we live in, a world that often has news of violence and warfare, and we often see the dignity and lives that are lost to battle and conflict. Lord, we long for your peace. We long for your peace to flood this world. So we cry out for your presence. And often we wonder, do you hear our cry, Lord? And then we think to ourselves, how small is our faith? For from the beginning of time, Lord, you've poured your love into the world. People have made decisions about how to respond to that love. Many have chosen to act in the ways of peace, in the ways of justice and mercy, and are involved in loving ministries of kindness and compassion. Some have not paid attention, and some have chosen to impose their own will on others, not acknowledging the rights and the lives of those that they oppress. Sometimes we, by our own attitudes, as well as our actions and our inactions, have acted in ways of oppression. But Lord, you were there. You forgive us. And not only do you forgive us, you heal us. You call us to be witnesses of peace to the world. We know that in you, we don't have to crawl to you during the night of our fears for healing. You've given us a new life in Jesus. One that has taught us about your love. And through Christ, we are adopted as your heirs, your beloved children. You've given us opportunities to bring hope and peace to others. So encourage our hearts, Lord. Lord, strengthen our spirits and strengthen our commitment to serve you. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
our closing hymn, This Is My Song. Now may the God of our mothers and fathers bless you. May God, who has guided us unto this day, lead you to be an honor to our people. And may God, who has protected us from all evil, make you to be a blessing for all humanity. Amen. <laughs>